Okay, so now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the philosopher Christy Dotson, specifically her work on epistemic oppression. Oppression just means prolonged injustice. So if you're an oppressed group, you are subjected to prolonged forms of injustice. So epistemic oppression, as Dotson defines it, refers to a persistent and unwarranted infringement on the ability to utilize shared epistemic resources and such oppression prevents certain people from making contributions to knowledge production. So a simpler way to put it, since we already know what epistemic injustice is, you can think of epistemic oppression as prolonged experiences of epistemic injustice. That's one way to think about it anyways. So epistemic oppression has been around as a concept since at least 1998. As Dotson points out, uh, it was sort of first talked about in the relevant literature by Miranda Fricker again, but it was pretty much ignored. It doesn't really turn up very much in the literature, and Dodson has a theory about why that is. She says people don't care about it, and the reason they don't seem to care about it is that they think that epistemic oppression is just more oppression. In other words, there's nothing really significantly epistemic about it. We can just reduce it to political oppression, and if it's just another form of political oppression, then we don't need a new concept. We don't need a concept of epistemic oppression. We can just talk about oppression. This is her theory about why the notion of epistemic oppression has more or less been overlooked or ignored. Now she says we can talk about two types of epistemic oppression. So her contribution is going to be to develop an account of these two different types. And she says one form is reducible epistemic oppression. And she says this kind of epistemic oppression, indeed, is reducible to social and political forms of oppression. But she says there is also a kind of irreducible epistemic oppression. And this is a kind of epistemic oppression that cannot be reduced to social or political forms of oppression. Okay, so you get the logic of her argument. She's, she's setting up a unique contribution to an ongoing conversation. She says Miranda Fricker, introduced this idea of epistemic oppression back in 1998. People have been ignoring it for about 15 years or 20 years. And she's saying she thinks it's been ignored because people think that epistemic oppression is reducible to political oppression. And she says it's not. There's a unique form of irreducible epistemic oppression, a kind of oppression that is irreducibly epistemic. Okay, so that's her contribution. Now, in addition to this distinction between two types of oppression, she's going to break the two types into what she calls first, second, and third order epistemic oppression. So first order epistemic oppression occurs when certain people start with lower default epistemic credibility due to prejudice. So this, she says, is one kind of reducible epistemic oppression. It's a kind of epistemic oppression that we can reduce to political oppression. So she says the value of epistemic credibility already exists. It just needs to be fairly applied. So it's not being a fairly applied due to certain historical factors. But if we as a society made a decision to organize our society in a more just fashion, this kind of oppression would go away. So we'll go back to the example that James Baldwin gave us. When Baldwin writes his letter to his nephew, he says, I know what Harlem is like, and you do too, but people don't believe us when we speak of it. And we said that's epistemic injustice. Their credibility is being downgraded simply because people are prejudiced against them. And Baldwin is saying, look, you know what epistemic trust is. You just need to distribute it evenly. So first order epistemic oppression is a kind of prolonged case of epistemic injustice. People like Baldwin are suffering epistemic injustice in a persistent, prolonged way in the context where he is writing. So another interesting thing to point out about epistemic oppression, and this is something that Dotson points out in the interview that she did on the podcast Elucidations, which I've linked to on Moodle. And she says, oppressed people are people in a condition where they have no good choices. They don't have a good option. And she says, this is true of people who suffer from epistemic oppression as well. So in Baldwin's position, he doesn't have a good option. He can share his knowledge and then suffer the backlash where people are saying, oh, you're exaggerating or 
oh, you're, you're, you're kicking up dust and causing problems where there shouldn't be any and so on. So if he speaks up, he has to suffer from the backlash. But if he doesn't speak up and if he doesn't share his knowledge, he suffers internally. His integrity suffers. So this is a case of epistemic oppression because he doesn't have a good option. There's also second order epistemic oppression. And, and this, she says, results from insufficient shared epistemic resources. So dominant accounts are skewed towards privileged members of society. So this also, Dotson argues, is reducible. It's reducible to a political form of oppression. Change here requires big shifts in epistemic resources, but the problem ultimately stems from historical, social, and political forms of marginalization. So to give an example here, I thought I would go back to the example I gave earlier of hermeneutical injustice. So second order epistemic oppression can be thought of as prolonged experiences of hermeneutical injustice. And again, this is reducible epistemic oppression because it can be dealt with merely by changing political structures. So you'll remember Coates gives us the example of growing up in a poor neighborhood in Baltimore and feeling like there was something that wasn't right, but he didn't have the educational resources yet for interpreting his experience. He just knew that was something was wrong. And now when he's older and he's an author and a very successful one, he's making the case that we should systematically redistribute wealth, restructure cities, fund inner city schools. He's made the case for reparations and so forth. And you get the idea. So this is Second order epistemic oppression, because basically the world where Coates grew up in was structured so that he wouldn't have the resources that he needed to understand his condition. He didn't have the educational resources that were necessary for him to understand his particular epistemic predicament. And the solution to that is a political one. You could change it by restructuring society. So it's reducible again because it's not distinctively epistemic. The result is epistemic. He suffers this prolonged condition of hermeneutical injustice, but the solution could be a purely political one. So it's not irreducible, rather, it's what Dotson calls reducible epistemic oppression. Okay, so then we get to third order epistemic oppression, and she says this is epistemic oppression that results from inadequate, dominant, shared epistemic resources. So this is when the epistemic resources themselves are inadequate. And she says, this is irreducible epistemic oppression. We can't reduce this to purely political oppression. Change here requires something like a paradigm shift. But the difficulty comes from seeing that a paradigm shift is necessary from within the current paradigm. A paradigm is a conceptual framework for interpreting reality. And the problem in these circumstances is that the conceptual framework that we have for interpreting our reality is inadequate. There are features of reality that we need to see, but we don't have the concepts that we need in order to sort of bring them into sight in a clear way. We need, first of all, to get people to come to see that the epistemic resources that we have are not good enough to bring into view the things that we need to see clearly. So it's an irreducibly epistemic problem. And the claim that epistemic oppression is reducible to political oppression is false. There are certain instances of epistemic oppression that we can't just reduce to politics or political solutions. Okay, so how about an example of what Dotson calls third order epistemic oppression? Well, we can get an example again from Baldwin and Coates. One theme that these authors share in common is the claim that the problem with racism in America is with the people who believe they are white. In other words, racism invented the concept of race, not the other way around. Now, this is an idea that Baldwin was already arguing for back in 1962. And effectively, what he's saying is, if you understand what race actually is, you realize it isn't a genuinely biological concept. When we pick out people 
as belonging to a race, we're not actually describing the natural world as it is in itself. We're describing something that has been constructed for the purpose of oppression. Effectively, it's been constructed to justify slavery. And so the idea here is that this is a form of third order epistemic oppression because this is an idea that was very difficult to get across to the dominant way of thinking. The dominant way of thinking about race for a very long time, and arguably still today, is that race is real, that it's a, uh, that it's a, it's a biological category, and it's something that you can see in the world. So when Baldwin and Coates argue that race isn't real, but rather is something that was created to justify racism, that's something that the people they're talking to can't even put themselves in a position to understand. They say, what do you mean I'm not white? Of course I'm white. I'm white and you're black and so on, right? People belong to different races. So what needs to happen in order for the position that Baldwin and Coates are defending to become clear to people is nothing less than a kind of revolution, a sort of shift in paradigm so that people start thinking about race in a radically different way. So the problem is fundamentally an epistemic one. These authors need to put people in a position so that they can see that their concepts are inadequate from within that very same conceptual framework. And, you know, you can see that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and, but it's also, it's an intrinsically epistemic problem. It's a problem where the conceptual resources themselves are deficient. Okay, so again, I want to give you another question to think about before you come to seminar this week. What are the best tools at our disposal for combating this kind of third order epistemic oppression? So when you see that the tools that we have, the conceptual framework that we have, is inadequate for solving the problems that we have, what can we do about it? What, what do you do when you're trying to communicate to somebody who sort of, in a certain sense, lives in a different world, who, who occupies a different paradigm or a different conceptual framework? How do you get them to see the very inadequacy of that framework from within it? Okay, so that's a question that, again, I'll ask you to think about and just pause for a minute and write down what you think and Bring it to seminar and we can talk about it this week.